Good morning, everyone. We're going to do things a little different this morning. We're going to have an acoustic set. We gave a couple day guys a day off, so we hope you enjoy it. And um, just feel free to worship as you usually do. I have unanswered prayers. I have trouble I wish wasn't there. And I have asked a thousand ways That you would take my pain away That you would take my pain away I am trying to understand How to walk this weary land Make straight the paths that crooked lie. Oh Lord, before these feet of mine. Oh Lord, before these feet of mine. When my world is shaking, heaven stands. Heaven 
perfect memory forever seeping. I was broken beyond repair. Then you came along and you sang a song over me. Feels like I'm born again. Feels like I'm living. For the very first time 
I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel Will I dance for you, Jesus? No, if you be still Will I stand in your presence Till my knees will I fall As we continue our stories and our series on why we hope, I'm reminded how every single one of us has a unique story, a story that can influence lives and help other people. And no matter how you might feel about your particular story, God can use your story to reach out to others, empowering and encouraging them to find love, just as we as believers have found love. The greatest story is that of Jesus, a sinless man sent to wash away the sins of the world by dying on a cross. And through the blood and the body of Jesus, we are saved and free to tell our stories of grace and love. And as we take communion this morning, let's remember the man who died on a cross, sacrificing himself 
and offering his body and his blood so that we may be free to live, free to love, and free to share the story of the life that we receive through Christ our King. There's only grace, and there's only love, and there's only mercy, and believe me, it's enough. Your sins are gone without a change. There's nothing we have now. There's only I got a message that was visiting our church because everybody taking the time off, we thought it'd be really cool to have a show. <laughs> and I must say, it's been awesome just because of the way I play and what you guys do on here. It's so Last time I played an acoustic guitar, all of us do for the very second, second service. Play. So it's been a long time coming. Just a long time.
Inside. 
on the ridge it feels kind of awkward since I'm part of that worship team for me to say that. Uh, so, but uh, no, I think it's great. It, uh, so I think it's awesome that, hold on, I got it. Sorry, I can't wear my wedding ring when I play that thing because I'll beat it up. So it feels weird not wearing my ring. Um, but I think it's great that Stan is able to, we're at a point where Stan can, can do this. He can take off and go do God's work, go take a vacation, whatever he needs to do, and still know that this place is in such great hands because of the people that are here. Um, not, not tooting my horn or anybody's horn up here, but there's so many people in this church and in this congregation that could just step in and do an amazing job. And it's so awesome to see that and to know that and to know that, that when we have these challenges, these things that come up, you know, when we have several people from the band that all needed the same day off, right? And we're able to step in and we're able to adapt and, and overcome and still just bring great worship, in my, in my opinion, and, and to hopefully, with God speaking through me, today to bring you guys a good word. Yeah, and I, I just pray, my prayer is that as I, Stan asked me to go through essentially some of my testimony and relate that to why I hope, why me personally, the series that we're in is why we hope. I'm going to be talking about why I hope, which is Howard asked me this morning, what's the title of your message? I said, why I hope. And he goes, well, that's the series that we're in. And I said, okay, why I hope. Right? Me. Um, so some of, you have, some of you have heard it, have heard my testimony. There's some, I guess, updates you could say on things. And uh, first I want to go in and, and just do a little recap of, I think Stan explained this last week, because I asked him when he, when he asked me to speak and told me what we were, what we were talking about. 
I said, well, what, what exactly is hope? And Stan explained it to me as a desire coupled with an expectation. Um, yeah, and so to me that meant we may have a desire in our lives for, for something to happen, but, but is the expectation that that's going to happen real? And therefore, is our hope real? Uh, the example that Stan gave me was, you know, he says, I may desire that when I come home that, you know, Tracy's there and she's prepared a beautiful, delicious meal, which I know Tracy prepares many delicious meals. Um, but if she's out of town on business for three days, there's no expectation that that's going to happen. So it's not a real hope. If, if he says, you know, um, you know, for me, and I was thinking about this and it, and it seemed weird to try to put it down on paper, you know, what is it that I have like a hope for? And, and I kind of went back and forth with a couple things. And one of the things being is this is the Memorial Day weekend. And, and I want to say thanks to the vets that, that we have here. Um, you know, my son, my oldest son, he's in the military and he's in Afghanistan right now. And um, with the Army, it's the second deployment. And he's got a wife and a baby on the way that's due in like three weeks. And he won't be here. But um, my hope and my desire is that my son's going to come home safe. He's going to get back to his wife, to his newborn baby, um, that he won't even be here to be born. Um, and I have the expectation that that's going to happen because one, even though he may not, um, he may not have the faith that I have, my son, um, he may not have the belief that I have in God. I pray for him. And I have that that expectation that God's going to bring him home safe. I also know that He's given the equipment and the training to make sure that he comes home safe. So He has all these things. So therefore, I can expect, and my hope in that is real. Um, Stan also asked me to, to kind of give my testimony and, and I think I explained that and, and base that base my message on that um, I'll just go back I grew up with parents that were um, at well an addict in some form of some form or another throughout my entire life um, whether it was alcohol for a while, it was it was hardcore drug, uh, meth, things like that, and and it was an abusive relationship. You know, my dad, my dad was abusive to my mom, uh, abusive to us kids, and you know, verbally and physically. And there were things that I knew, like, you know, that's not right. And I know there's a lot of times in in our lives there's those patterns that we grow up with. And and sometimes those patterns get repeated. Well, in my mind, all growing up, I knew, okay, this is not the pattern. I, I don't want to continue. Um, my dad, actually, at the very heart, at his very core, he's a great man, huge heart. But it was all these other outside influences, alcohol, drugs, things like that. We all know that those, those greatly affect our personality and how we deal with things. Um, and I, for some reason, understood that at a really young age, that, you know, that's, this guy over here is not my dad. The guy that, that when somebody says they have a need, that goes and takes care of that need, that's my dad. And that's the part of my dad that I want. And so growing up, things, you know, things were rough. I, I have three brothers that, um, from my dad's first marriage, so they're my half-brothers, that would always go back and forth. They'd get in trouble with their mom, so they'd run away and come to dad. They'd get in trouble with dad, they'd run away and go to mom. Um, and then as they got older, they're always in and out of prison. Weird, I became a cop, right? So I'm like, oh, I'm the black sheep of the family. And um, so when I was, <laughs> and, and I seriously, truly, 100% owe that, owe that all to God. Um, and growing up, so get into high school, as a junior in high school, um, 
at 17 years old. My girlfriend, who's the principal's daughter, is pregnant, right? And so I'm like, huh, wow, what am I going to do? And um, so I became a dad at 17. I tested out of high school, went to work, and um, just became the best dad that I knew how to be at 17. And um, tried to do everything that I could, didn't always do things right. Uh, my, my first wife and I, that, that girl from high school, we got married our junior year. We stayed married for almost another 15 years. And we had three, three kids biologically. We adopted two more. So we had five. And um, one day that all just crashed down. One day she just up and moved in with the dude that she was working with. And um, for me, I'm like, man, I've been with this woman since I was 14 years old. So freshman year in high school, we've got five kids together. I, I don't even know what to do. And here I am going through all these things and like just not knowing. And I had, I had a relationship with God. Her family actually, her dad um, was a chaplain in the National Guard, very strong Christian family. Uh, and of course, you know, we ended up in the situation we were in because we're teenagers. We make our own choices, have our own free will. God's not going to take that from us. And uh, so I got saved and baptized when I was 19. So we've been together for a couple of years. But I never really had a relationship with God, even up till this point. Played on the worship team. Um, actually, just a couple months prior to all that, to, to us separating and things. I became a youth pastor at my church, and I, I thought that I had a relationship with God, but I didn't really know what that meant, and I didn't know really where that hope was. So after she left, I've got the kids with me. Um, I, I, uh, what's the word? I went out looking for some, some wise counsel from a man that I really respect that I went to church with, and he told me, he says, here's what we're going to do. And he says, we're going to fast our dinner meals for the next three days. Instead of eating dinner, you're going to go pray. And I want you to go get some unleavened bread and some grapes. Every morning, I want you to get up. And the first thing that you do is you go out and you um, find a nice, quiet place. And you take communion and you pray. And take time not to just pray and talk to God, but listen to God. And uh, like I said, it was it was a really, really, really rough time. And, and let me go back. Just prior to this, for the weeks leading up to this, when I finally talked to this guy, I'm reading all these books. I'm doing all these other things. I'm, I'm trying to talk to her. And, oh, you know, just go back. Because my world was upside down. I didn't know what I was going to do. And um, and I just tried to do all these things on my own and not really rely on God. So I asked this guy, I said, how, do, how long do I do this communion thing in the morning for? And he said, as long as it takes. I said, well, how will I know how long that is? He goes, you'll know. You'll just know. And, you know, and then I thought, man. I got to be at work at 7, so I usually get up at 6, which means to go do this communion thing, I'm going to have to get up at like 5 while the kids are still in bed. Oh, that's early. Well, so I said, I'm going to try it. Nothing else is working. Nothing I'm doing is working, so what the heck, Let's give it a shot. And so I started doing that. And there were times I found this place because he told me to find a nice, quiet place. This community that I lived in, there was a little bit newer housing development behind us, and they had a park that sat up on the hill, and it looked out over, I know you're going to laugh, it looked out over the city of Orville, which actually from a distance is really nice. Uh, from a distance, it's great. So, it, so I would sit out there at this picnic table with my Bible, and and I would read a couple passages, and I would pray, and I would take the time to listen. And this went on for about a week. And one morning, you know, 
And, and there were there were times in here where I I mean I was just I was destroyed. I was down on my knees, and it's five o'clock in the morning. There's houses like 50 yards behind me. I'm screaming, "Why? What do I do?" And like yelling at the top of my lungs on my knees. And like I said, about a week into this, um, all of a sudden, you know, I'm praying, crying, whatever, not knowing what to do. And it was like everything stopped. The birds stopped chirping. The wind stopped blowing. Everything just got quiet. And I felt that still small voice inside me say, it's going to be okay. You're going to get through this. And at first I was like, all right, sweet. You know, God's going to bring my wife back. We're going to work through this. And it took me even a little while longer to realize that that's not his plan. She did what she did, and that's her own choice. And again, God promised us he's not going to mess with our free will. That was her free will to do what she wanted to do. So I had to work through a whole process of just forgiving and let's move on and, and to find that hope. And it was, like I said, it was during that time that I really found God. And, um, you know, one of, one of the verses, which I didn't actually put on here, that, um, that really helped me. And I had it written on, the, on a piece of paper and I had it like stuck to the roof of my patrol car when I was working it up was um, Joshua 1 5 where God says I will, for I will be with you as I was with Moses I will not fail you or abandon you and I stood on that verse for the longest time and uh, it was when I like I said when I finally came to that realization that no matter what I did in myself and in the world I wasn't going to make that thing for the I wasn't going to be okay in myself so I had to, I had to um, getting back to that desired expectation, I had the desire to have my life be good, do something different. My expectation was on the wrong person. Hope. God. A um, couple of the things that I, that I came to realize within that is it, and how I was able to go, okay, this is where my hope needs to be was to realize that, that I'm valuable to God. Um, if we could bring the, the first verse up, Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5. God's talking to Jeremiah, and, and Jeremiah says this, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to me. And it was just like, Wow. God knew me before I was even born. And, and he, it, I had to look up the definition of consecration. <laughs> and the one that I saw that stuck out to me, which, which means God set me apart. So me, this guy that, that basically screwed up his kind of life plan by at least my own plan, by getting his girlfriend pregnant at age 17 before I had a job, before I had any direct time. I'm valuable. He set me apart from everything else. And so that was one of the things that, that I really had to hold on to. And it kind of made me think of when I was a kid and like birthdays or Christmas, I get all these presents, right? But there was that one thing that one toy, that one whatever, that to me was more valuable than anything else. And that was the one that got over here. Everything else was kind of in a pile. This one, this is mine. And that's, that's how I just feel like God is with us. Each and every one of us, we're our own special thing within this world, within this family. We're all valuable and have our own part. Um, Okay, so he's, he's done that, and he's, and he's given me, I'm valuable, and he's given me a certain purpose. And let's see, when I was 22, when I started working in law, and I started working in the jail and worked there for a couple of years, got moved out on patrol. 
and pretty much from the time I hit the street control, I thought, you know, you couldn't, there's nobody, there's no way that anybody could tell me I was back to God. Um, I get so many opportunities to impact people's lives. Sometimes it may, you know, there, there's fallout where it may impact the life of a kid whose parent died or something to that effect. And that's never my intention. My intention is always to, to do something to make that person's life better, that family. And, um, you know, I, I struggled with a lot of things in that and getting to that point. And a couple of years, well, it's been about a year, I got to work in a unit within the sheriff's office that had that where I was basically kind of like a probation role. I had a case load of people I could check on. You know, they were people that were sent to jail, but the jail doesn't have a room, so had them on ankle. And so I got to work very closely and build a relationship with these guys. And a lot of the other cops were like, they're a piece of trash. And I got to know him. And there was one in particular that, a 20-year-old kid, I call him. And he, he'd been using drugs since he was 15 years old. And that's all he knew. That's all he knew. And through talking to him, um, through talking to him and getting to know him and encouraging him, I could see I could see him changing. He had only been on my caseload for maybe a month or so, and he slipped up, you know, and he went out and he was someplace he shouldn't have been, and into some people that he shouldn't have been hanging out with, and he got high. And so when I talked to him about it, like he started crying, and I was like, "Why are you so upset?" And he goes, because I disappointed you. He goes, I'm disappointed in myself, but he goes, you're like the first person in life that I've supported and, and pushed me. And he goes, and it really upsets me. He goes, he goes, I can promise you it won't happen again. Because I had I had this policy with the people on my caseload. If you messed up, just be honest. With you. We can work with honesty. If you lie to me, you're going to go sit back in jail and I'm going to be in place. Um, and so he was honest with me right from the start. And so I, I told him, I said, remember that feeling. And the next time you reach down and grab him. And I kept working with him, and I, and I always, I gave him probably a little bit more freedom than other people that were on my caseload or people that were on my and he's one day he says, "Why do you do that?" And I said, "Because, because I feel like you, um, you're going to make the right." So this is your program, which really made me think about my life. It's like this life is mine, be or to fail. And so, anyway, time goes on. Um, I get pulled out of that program and get put back on the street. And I know that he, he graduated the program and he finished the program and finished the time. And before I had left, he was talking to me about how he was going to um, move out of this area, very old, where all this bad connections. He was going to try to get out of here. And uh, so I left, came back out, was working the street for a couple months, hurt my knee at home for a couple of years with, with a messed up knee. Came back to work, and then a lot of you probably remember just after Christmas, I got into a situation, bad situation, getting stuff, and I can't really go into details about that. But for a while, maybe a couple months, and even still now, occasionally, I kept questioning, why am I even here? What am I, what am I even doing? Uh, and I'm going, you know, with with the passing of Prop 47, drugs were pretty much not even a crime. Um, what, what's my purpose? Why am I even doing it? And um, I just went through this phase. I was kind of in a funk for a minute. 
And then one day, out of the blue, I get a text from this guy that I was talking about that was on my caseload, and it's a picture of him holding his newborn baby, telling me, thank you for always being there while I was on the program, encouraging me, supporting me. I have a cut, dope, since this day, I've got a good job, I need to get married, and I just want to thank you. And then I went, there's my purpose. That's why I'm valuable to God, because I have that ability to, to look past that outside of people and, and encourage their heart, encourage them better for themselves, for the world. Um, the next, and, and I guess I already kind of touched on it, maybe I jumped ahead. The next thing was, was not only am I valuable to God, but God has a plan for my life. In, um, in Matthew 10, uh, it says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not, not one of them shall fall to the ground without your father? But the very hairs, hairs of your head all number. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than any sparrow. And it also says it again in Luke, at this time, with five sparrows. And it's the same thing. Fear not, you are of more value than any sparrow. Number that hairs on your head were numbered. And I just thought about that. That God, the guy who made everything, the guy who made this universe, actually took the time to number the hairs on your head. And for some of us, Tom, that number's gone drastically down. Uh, mine's, it's going to go, but when it starts going, it's gone. I'm, I'm shaving. Uh, you know, and, and I said, man, why is this important? And again, we realize that we're so important to God. We're so valuable to Him. When we get to that point, it helps us rely on Him. And it helps us put our faith and our hope and our expectation in God. Um, and what I wrote down here in my notes was, when we rely on God, we have an expectation that He's faithful. He will provide what we much like, and, and provide it exactly when we need it, in his perfect time. Much like a baby relies on its mom. It's a little, a little helpless infant or the baby bird. Can't feed itself, can't get its own food. You know, it's only four, half a box of early before it needs it. Um, so so God, God is that for us, our protection. If we can't if we can't expect him to work in our life, if we can't foster that relationship, then, then we've got, we've got our, our lives don't really have a lot of purpose. Because I know I can't do something. And even though, you know, my wife will be here next service, if you talk to her, I fall very short and putting God first outwardly in my home life. Um, it's still there. I still have a desire and like that he's always going to lead me the right way. And then finally, I could put my hope in God because of who he is. Um, and, and I don't know who he is to you, but I know who he is to me. What you and and I found this video. Actually, I I saw this video right about the same time in my life that all this stuff, was and it really stuck. Some of you may have seen it before, um, but to me, it describes exactly.
that, that's the Jesus that I serve. That's the God that I serve. He is the king of my life. And it's because of those things. Uh, he just, it makes it so much easier when you know who he is. You know who he is for you to be able to just give everything to him and to let him handle it. Um, I used to say, I used to say God gave me big shoulders so I could carry a lot. And then I realized I don't have to carry it because it's his, because he's all those things. He's all powerful. He overcame death. He first died for me because I'm not valuable. Then he overcame that death. And and he's just he's just amazing. And uh, I don't know where I'd be without him. You know, but I know where I am with him. I know where I am now, and I'm doing things in my life that I never thought I would be able to do. I have the most amazing life. We've been able to be a blessing to other people in our family, our community, to um, raise this little boy that I love so much that it's just, uh, it's a joy every day. And it's so much different doing it now than when I was 17 trying to do things. And the relationship that, that I've been able to grow through him, it just makes it so much easier. And I just, if you don't know him, I encourage you, please take the time to get to know him and realize how much easier it is when you hope in God and you expect him. That's what he's there for. He lives for you. As a dad, I love it when my kids call me and say, hey, dad, I need this able to do it you know they expect and sometimes i'm like oh, again but really i do it with a joyful heart and um you know i mentioned my son that's deployed right now he and i didn't have the best relationship when his mom uh when his mom and i split up and we didn't talk for a while and after his first deployment in afghanistan i got a random message from him on facebook and I just told him, if you ever want to talk, give me a call. Five minutes later, he called me. He says, you know what I realized? Our problems that we have here, they're nothing. They're nothing compared to what those people are dealing with. And, um, and it just really made me think of that. And for me, it made me so thankful because growing up, he was my little buddy. He was beside me. We did everything together. And all of a sudden, I have no that I got last week. I was able to uh, put together a package for my grandson that's on my on his way, and send it off to them. As soon as they got it, I got a message, from my son. and it, that it made me feel better than anything I felt in a long time. And and again, I just praise Jesus for that. But I know he's a good God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, to share my story, to share my testimony. And not because, not because it glorifies me, not because it shows that, oh, well, Will's this awesome guy that, that can do all things through, you know, that does all these things, has this awesome relationship with God. Somehow. Father, I couldn't do it without you. Father, I, I can't continue to do these things without you. Lord. God, I just pray that, that you would move in this place, continue to move in this room, Lord. Begin to stir hearts. Father, in, in those that don't know you, that you would just begin to stir their heart and point them towards you. Father, that those that have maybe strayed a little bit, Lord, that you would, you would just rein them in and get their eyes focused back on you, Lord. Lord, let them see and let us see what an amazing God you are. Make it easy for us to put our hope in you and our trust and our faith and, and just move and stir in this place, Lord. And, and Father, we ask these things just so that we can be lights for you, so that we can go out and speak, so that each and every one of us can share our testimony with people, so that people would realize that maybe they're not the only ones in the situation that they're in. 
God, and, and that they too can have that. They can have love. They can have hope. They can have the Lord, just that, that warm embrace from a God and a Father. And I pray, God, that as we go into worship, and worship you again before we leave, Lord, that you would just move in this place. Let's worship. Now it's time to pray for our offering. Yay! Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this family that celebrates giving. We give because we love and because it's not ours anyway. It's yours. We pray that you'll bless this offering and use it to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So before we give, what is our purpose? And how do we do that? Oh, awesome. So until we meet again in Christ, we always have. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming. Even when the rain 
rain falls Even when the flood starts rising Even when the storm comes I hear washed by the water storm comes I hear a wash by the water even when the earth crumbles under my feet even when the ones I love turn around and crucify me I won't ever ever let you down I won't fall I won't fall, I won't fall as long as you're around me, even when the rain falls, even when the flood starts rising, even when the storm comes, I hear him washed by the water, even when the rain falls, even when the flood starts rising. Even when the storm comes, I hear washed by the water. Even when the earth crumbles under my feet. Even when the ones I love turn around and crucify me. I won't ever, ever let you down. I won't fall. I won't fall, I won't fall as long as you're around me, even when the rain falls, even when the flood starts rising, even when the storm comes, I hear a wash by the water, even when the rain falls, even when the flood starts rising. Even when the storm comes, I hear washed by the water. Thank you. Everybody have a wonderful week.